this many? I guess. All right, all right. What about this? Ooh. Hey. Come back. <laughs> Come back with my money. <laughs> so essentially, what's the difference between these two? I mean, they're both pieces of paper. Good question. Money is anything that fulfills three requirements. It has to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and most importantly, a store of value. So in essence, there's no difference between those two. They're both just pieces of paper. Let's see how currency creation works in the United States. The American dollar, after all, is the world's reserve currency. Dollars come into being when the treasury issues bonds. Commercial banks buy them in the open market and sell them to the Federal Reserve. The Fed pays for these bonds with currency that they print. That's for paper currency. The dollar bills we're used to seeing and touching. The process is a little different for electronic currency. That's the stuff we use through our debit cards and bank accounts. That currency is created by the commercial banks. It sounds odd, I know, but commercial banks create currency. We have fractional reserve banking to thank for that. Commercial banks create currency when someone makes a deposit. Banks have to, by law, hold a certain fraction of deposits as reserves. Hence the term fractional reserve banking. Let's assume a 10% reserve ratio. If someone deposits $100 into the bank, the bank holds $10 as reserves. The remaining 90 is used to issue new loans. But here's the trick. They don't use the actual $90 that was deposited. Instead, they simply type an entry into their customer's account, and there we have it. New electronic currency has just been created. The process goes on because that new currency will show up as a deposit in another bank. They do the same as the first bank. $9 is held as reserve, and $81 worth of loans are created. The process can carry on until that initial deposit of $100 creates $900 worth of new currency. That's the magic of commercial banks for you. But all of this is debt. In fact, what we call money in the modern banking system is nothing but debt. Credit cards work in a sort of similar fashion. They extend a loan to you, that's currency created out of thin air, yet they expect you to pay back with interest. You might be thinking that this is a strange financial system. You're right, it is. It hasn't always been like this. If we look back in time, people had a spirited dislike for central banking. It was a contentious issue in American politics during the tenure of President Andrew Jackson. In 1832, he vetoed a bill meant to recharter one of the Fed's predecessors. Although it had passed through Congress, he justified his veto by asserting that the bank was unauthorized by the Constitution, subversive to the rights of states, and dangerous to the liberties of the people. It's not only President Andrew Jackson who had a disparaging view of central banks. One of America's founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, also warned the American people about the dangers of central banking. He said, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The contestation didn't end in the 19th century. Eventually, it culminated in the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. At least at that point in history, the American dollar was backed by gold. It didn't take long for that to be done away with. In 1971, President Nixon temporarily suspended the convertibility of dollars into gold. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. From that moment on, the American dollar ceased to be money and became nothing more than fiat currency. Bear in mind that for the individual, this ability to exchange dollars for gold had long since disappeared. By the late 1960s, only foreign governments and central banks could exchange their dollars for gold. Many people are coming to realize that crucial truth about the Federal Reserve. 
It's not federal in the sense of being a part of the American government. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Put simply, it's a private bank. Yet, against Jefferson's advice, they have the monopoly over the issuance of American currency. Look at the American economic landscape. People are paying the price for not heeding his advice. Most people can no longer make ends meet on one income. The majority of people are held in debt bondage. Americans are overwhelmed by debt. The government cannot pay its debts too. That the American government can't possibly pay all of its debts seems an incredible suggestion, false even. But it's true, there is not enough currency to pay off the debt. Another quirk of our current monetary system is that paying back debts is deflationary because it reduces the amount of currency circulating in the system. Perhaps that's why successive American presidents are in the habit of accumulating debt. This fractional reserve central banking system is not limited to the United States. It's in force all over the world. Recent political debates in South Africa brought to public attention that the South African Reserve Bank has private shareholders. The Reserve Bank has warned that nationalizing the entity would only have dire consequences for the country. Speaking to the SABC, Reserve Bank Governor Lesetjo Chaniajo said the move would only benefit a few individuals with self-seeking motives. This week, the ANC's Deputy Secretary General, Jesse Duarte, said the bank was failing to cushion the run because it was privately owned. Clearly, everywhere on earth, what we call money is not sound. It's confidence-backed fiat currency. With the creation of currency unhinged from any hard limit, the results are likely to be disastrous. And disaster is exactly what we got from this system. There have been many financial crises rooted in the rapid expansion of credit or currency that characterizes the modern financial system. One crisis worth talking about is the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis that almost sunk the entire world's financial system. In the wake of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, the then Federal Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan, lowered interest rates to historically low levels. We found out earlier on that borrowing creates currency. Loosening interest rates in the manner that the Fed did greatly expanded the supply of currency in the American economy. That's because many more people borrowed more money, more currency. This newly created currency found its way into the housing market. House prices went up and that fueled greater speculation. Along with that, predatory practices by mortgage brokers meant that variable interest rate mortgages were sold to people whose ability to pay was questionable. Disproportionately, the victims were poor. When interest rates went up, more and more people found it difficult to pay. Not surprisingly, many began to default. This brought carnage onto the financial markets. This is going to be one of the watershed days in financial markets history. It was a manic Monday in the financial markets. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. I don't think anyone really expected a bank as big as Lehman to uh, you know, be in a position that it's in now. Brought down by bad mortgage investments, Lehman, which has 25,000 employees, will be liquidated. Mortgage financiers had bundled up these so-called subprime mortgages and sold them on to other financial institutions. They, in turn, created derivatives to sell on to others. The gambling went on as derivatives of derivatives were passed around in the financial sector. When the defaults happened, the game in this casino came to a crashing halt. A financial meltdown appeared imminent. The government had to come to the rescue. That's unthinkable to those who believe in unfettered free markets. President Bush, in a special televised address to the American people, announced the beginning of what was to be the biggest government bailout in American history. Mr. President, President Bush, he begins to talk about the financial system in America. CBS News Special Report, a presidential address to the nation. Good evening. 
This is an extraordinary period for America's economy. Over the past few weeks, many Americans have felt anxiety about their finances and their future. I understand their worry and their frustration. We've seen triple-digit swings in the stock market. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. As uncertainty has grown, many banks have restricted lending. Credit markets have frozen, and families and businesses have found it harder to borrow money. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding with decisive action. And how there's some challenges, some problems, but they have it under control. Numbers vary, but it's said that anywhere between $2 and $29 trillion was committed to rescuing the financial system. While it began at the tail end of George W. Bush's presidency, state assistance to the financial sector continued well into Barack Obama's presidency. At this particular moment, with the private sector so weakened by this recession, the federal government is the only entity left with the resources to jolt our economy back into life. In reaction to the banker bailout and general concerns about fiat currency, an anonymous brilliant person or persons going by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin. This is the world's first cryptocurrency. It's difficult to overstate the importance of this innovation. The last time people could confidently trade without relying on governments or any other central authority for that matter was over a millennia ago. And even then, it wasn't exactly smooth trading. With the arrival of cryptocurrency, a veritable means of transaction between individuals in a totally free way was now here. What an incredible thing Bitcoin is. It's still here working after I don't know how many years it's been and it hasn't even been changed and it doesn't, it's not owned or controlled by any company. So we recognize, we said blockchain now allows you to have no central control. Everything's diversified. And because everything has records that are duplicates of each other, it's totally trustable. There can't be any mistaken uh, records in there. Along with cryptocurrency came blockchain technology. The latter was necessary for the former. As the old adage goes, necessity is the mother of invention. To ensure the smooth and reliable functioning of Bitcoin, Nakamoto had to solve a problem that is inherent in electronic currencies. Without a central authority, how can it be made certain that the same unit of currency is not spent twice? Centralized electronic currencies don't have this double spend problem. In their system, effectively there's one central ledger that keeps track of all transactions. Because Bitcoin is underpinned by a desire to have trustless money, having a central authority was not an option. The solution Nakamoto came up with was blockchain. Simply, blockchain is a distributed ledger. Leveraging the power of maths, distributed copies of the ledger are kept current with one another. This was an ingenious solution to the double spend problem without requiring a trusted central authority. As great as this innovation was, there's one big problem. Bitcoin is much like fiat currency in the sense that there is no value underlying it. That there is a hard limit to how much Bitcoin there can be is great. But fundamentally, with nothing backing Bitcoin, how much further have we gone from fiat currency? This is why asset-backed cryptocurrencies like Goldman's GMA token are important. It's important to underpin blockchain cryptocurrency with a strong foundation. Gold can be that foundation. Gold has always been the real money. In fact, gold is unique in the sense that it doesn't change. The gold that the Lydians used around 650 BC could physically be the same gold sitting in a bullion bar in a vault somewhere. The same applies for the gold that Cleopatra had. Look at the price of gold ever since 1971. It has held its value much better than the United States dollar. In simple terms, ever since the removal of the gold standard, it takes many more dollars to buy the same ounce of gold. So the solution was blockchain married with gold in places where people would not necessarily go. People are not clamoring to come mine in Africa. Natural big corporations. You don't see these huge corporations clamoring. They're here, so some here, but on a very, very small scale relative to the amount of gold here. Now, for whatever reason, people have not caught on to that and I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity I had to actually get here, establish a company, take this 
business plan and this idea and expand on it into a, a business plan. And not only a business plan, but something that can be expanded into a vision. A vision where intrinsic value is introduced into the blockchain and then that blockchain technology is now a global product. Money, 21st century money, has to be the amalgamation of the freeing technology of blockchain with the historically stable store of value that is gold. While in theory there are other solutions, this one is right here, right now. You're gonna be losing value if you are making that grave mistake of treating uh, currency like money.